So you'll see that the title of the talk has changed slightly. And part of this is because this is a presidential address and not a typical science talk, then um, it needs to be written down somewhere to go into the transactions. And so I just thought I would save time by sort of combining the two and looking at almost a philosophical view of how we approach science and citizen science and dealing with climate modeling and biodiversity emergencies. It's always interesting to give climate change talks during cold periods. It would have been even worse last week. I gave a talk back in the late 90s, early 2000s in Chicago, and it was so cold that they took me to see a northern sawed owl perched on a branch. It was so cold that as it pooped, it did literally froze and was just right on the branch. And so their attitude was, how quickly can we have global warming? And the problem, of course, is that it's not a la carte. And in fact, oddly enough, and it's hard to convince politicians of this, sometimes the warmer weather can actually cause colder, wetter, snowier conditions. So you just the best thing to do is to try to be as normal as possible. It's been a long, strange year, I guess. I, I regret not having had the chance to meet most of you um, since my last talk in October of 2019. And the logical talk would probably have been on how COVID went from animals to humans. But that story is still incomplete and I will refer back to it several times. That COVID is a zoonosis, um, that it did jump from animals is, is pretty clear. You know, we know, for example, that COVID-like viruses with genomes that are more than 90% similar are found both around Wuhan and now they've discovered throughout Southeast Asia. And viruses jumping from bats in particular, but other animals to humans is also fairly common. I mean, we have Ebola, we have Nessa fever. So as humans encroach more on nature, we then have a greater risk of future pandemics overall. We really need to think about the small and what we know and what we don't know. Because how the large succeed or fail is really owing to the small. And this is whether we think about things in terms of seeds or mycorrhizal fungi, bacteria, um, or particularly viruses. We often are brought up with a view of humans at the top of this giant pyramid that, that trickles all down to this giant base. And I would argue that we need to turn that pyramid upside down, or we, need, or we at least need to trickle it back down to a point of the small. Because what happens to the small, what happens to the things we can't see or we ignore, we ignore at our own peril. So what in the world are the 10,000 small? Well, in the Eastern philosophy of Taoism, the yin and the yang, the duality, give rise to the five elements, earth, water, fire, metal, wood. And these in various combinations become the 10,000 small. Everything exists, everything that exists. And this includes everything from the life on earth to the, the mountains and the land and the soil and the earth itself. So what then is the tapestry that I'm talking about? Well, the tapestry is how these threads, the small, are put together. So we often go out and see the small. We may go out and see the fruiting bodies of the fungi. We'll go out and see the birds. We'll go out and see the galls. But how do they fit within the overall landscape? So consider the 10,000 small in this talk to be all of the species or all of the possible notes of music, or all of the colors. How are they put together? And that's the tapestry. So phenomena never exist on their own. They arise in constant dependence on an infinite number of causes and conditions. And that's part of the tapestry, that's the background. But what happens when you pull one thread? Well, possibly nothing. You, know, you may not notice that the thread has been pulled out. But if you pull the key thread, the whole tapestry can unravel. So what happens when we stop living in harmony with nature? 
Well, we're seeing that now. A lot of people wonder what the value of nature is. And some of the figures I've seen for the economic costs of COVID have been on the order of, I think, well over a trillion dollars now. And this is stopping living in harmony with nature. At some point in time, the coronaviruses that were present inside bats made the jump probably to an intermediate species and made the jump to humans. And that jump was not from people just living in harmony with their environment or with nature. Because even when you have things like Nyssa virus, which is common and widespread in flying foxes, it usually does not spread to humans unless humans have moved into the environment where there are a lot of flying foxes. So when we stop living in harmony with nature, when we start disrupting things, then we run, start running the risk that we're going to see unintended consequences. And it's important to realize that the earth did not come with an owner's manual. Now, many of you probably have no idea what either one of these items are. Um, they're American. The whole last whole earth catalog and the whole earth catalog was uh, 60s to early 70s. Um, you would almost call it the hippie Bible. It was basically, what tools do you need to go back to live on the land in a sustainable fashion? And the Mother Earth News started at about the same time and still continues to this day, giving advice on how people can live more in harmony with the earth. But neither one of those is an owner's manual. We as scientists do not know how things are put together. We don't even know all of the parts. So when we start playing around with them, when we start destroying things, we really don't know what's going to happen. So what then is the role of the naturalist and the citizen scientist in all of this? As we move ever more out of harmony with nature, we need this owner man owner's manual more than ever. And in part because we don't have an owner's manual and in part because the, the standard experimental technique will not get us there, what we need are observations, careful observations people spending time with, in nature, seeing how things are put together. I remember um, one of you, maybe not on this talk in October when I gave my talk, talking about an observation they'd made on a local uh, fungi species, I think it was, or, or maybe it was a butterfly. And noticing something that people may not have noticed before, or if it was noticed before, it hadn't been written down. This is the information that we as scientists we as stewards of the earth desperately need. So without an owner's manual, all we can do is to make observations, to report, to look for patterns, to then hypothesize, and then to develop models and to test the models, treat the results of the models as hypotheses, continue to go back and don't think we know exactly what's going on. You know, we could be making mistakes at any step in the process. So we're trying to write an owner's manual and we're trying to write the owner's manual as we go along and as things change and as they break, as they reform and as they reassemble, as we discover new pieces, as pieces go extinct. It's an owner's manual in constant flux and we're really behind. Things are changing faster than we're keeping up with it. So the citizen scientist, the naturalist, you are the discoverer of the threads. You're the librarians, you're the archivists. You play a major role in now collecting the data that can be used to look for patterns. Many scientists are not naturalists and this has become more true than ever. I started my career as an ornithologist and so as a card carrying member at that time of the American Ornithologist Union, you'd go to the meetings and you would go to taxonomy talks, the people who work in museums and they knew their species or they would know their family. They would know the taxonomy thoroughly, but they knew absolutely nothing about the bird. They knew it as an object, but not as a being not as an integral part of the ecosystem. So as science has gotten more specific, as it's gotten more rigid almost, 
the scientists have really started to lose track of the whole, looking at the system holistically. And the naturalists, you, the citizen scientists, you're that link back to the whole, back to the ecosystem. Without you, my work would not even be possible, nor the work of many, many other scientists who work on biodiversity issues in the UK or globally because we rely on these global data sets. We rely on them both to model the future, but we rely on data that's collected every year for looking at things like phenology. Are birds arriving earlier? Are, is bud break earlier? What has changed? How do we tie that to climate change? Are species shifting their ranges? And as we start thinking about things like introduced species, non-native species, we need to even start thinking about, rethinking about how we think about these species. Is it non-native because it's a climate refugee? We probably should start talking about some species, particularly European species, as climate refugees. They're here because they're being pushed by the climate to come here. They're adapting. They're adapting naturally. And we should not think of them as an invasive species, but they could have invasive species like impacts on the environment. And these days, it is also often you who needs to teach the scientists about how these threads may be put together. You've become the eyes and the ears of the scientists on the ground. As we spend the time in classrooms or spend the time in our laboratories or spend the time on very small patches of ground, it's your observations that help trigger the curiosity that help us to do the work in which we need to do. And it's you who does most of the monitoring anymore. Much of the monitoring globally, except for highly specific species, is done by volunteers, be it, be it the BBS in the US or the BBS in the UK or any of the other surveys that are taking place or all of the moth trapping that goes on. So it's you who does much of the monitoring or collecting of the data on environmental change. So what is a naturalist? Well, to the true naturalist, the concrete experience of living things in our natural setting is at least as precious as any generalization or law that he can derive from his observations. And this does make the naturalists differ from many scientists. And much remains to be learned about the habits and ways of life of organisms of all kinds, from flowers and insects to birds and mammals, their ecology or interactions with their physical environment and each other is a fruitful field of study. Now this was written by Alexander F. Scutch and his naturalist in Costa Rica in 1971. And Alexander Scutch was a card carrying scientist. He went into the tropics to collect plants and he never left. And he was inspired by reading books that kept saying nidification unknown, nidification unknown, meaning there's no nest to have been found of these species to go out and find the nests, to find the information, to find what we need to know about the tapestry of life. Academic training does not a naturalist make. So over the centuries, there have been great naturalists who've been academics and there have been great naturalists who are not academics. And now that we get most of our natural history in non-pure scientific journals, you could argue that many of the best naturalists may not be academics even now. But consider some of the local and global great naturalists of the 18th and 19th century. Alexander von Humboldt, definitely an academic, he was a rock star of his time. Uh, when he died, he had some of the biggest funerals ever globally. So he was an academic, but he wrote and he saw the world with an artist's eye. And so he wrote about things in ways that the general public could understand of how the world was put together. Charles Darwin, an academic, but by most accounts, more interested in collecting beetles than going to class. But again, he had the eye. He, had, he was able to observe nature, to see patterns, and then to ask the questions to come up with critical thinking. 
how did species evolve? What were the mechanisms? But we also have Alfred Wallace. Wallace is the father of biogeography. Um, we've named our initiative, our work in climate change modeling after Alfred Wallace. Wallace co-discovered evolution, but was not an academic. He was relatively poor. He went to, to a mechanics institute. He paid for all of his research by going into the tropics, collecting animal species, plants, insects, and sending them back. And yes, in theory, the story is he co-discovered evolution. His theory of evolution came while he was in a malaria haze. But nevertheless, his work in the Malay Archipelago, his work on speciation, his observations are still first rate. You know, we still have Wallace's line differentiating groups of species in, in Southeast Asia, in, in Indonesia. Henry Walter Bates, if you've heard of Batesian mimicry, um, Bates left school to intern when he was 13. Like Wallace, he spent most of his life tramping through the tropics, collecting species, paying for it with his collections, and making critical observations and writing books about it. And if we move into the 20th century, one of my predecessors in this role, Emma Turner, you know, her work rediscovering the bitter and her work as, you know, the first naturalist um, on Skullt Head Island as, as the warden, you know, her work was every bit the naturalist and academic naturalist as many academics, as was Margaret Morris Nice for her studies of song sparrows. So, you don't need to be an academic to be a naturalist. And we need far more naturalists than we have now. So where have all the academic naturalists gone then? We should sing this to the tune of where have all the flowers gone? Well, this may be a bit controversial, but I pin it on Sir Karl Popper. One of the most important scientific philosophers of the 20th century. Note that's the key is philosophy as opposed to necessarily a scientist. He rejected inductive reasoning in science, replacing it with empirical falsification. So a scientist then formulates hypothesis, he attempts to falsify it. If it's falsified, a second hypothesis is formulated. And while this is an oversimplification or even a gross oversimplification, this shift to Popperian thinking in the 60s and 70s in natural science, in ecology, has had major impacts both in the advancement and the lack of advancement in understanding the natural world. So it became much more difficult to get grants or to publish scientific papers that were not hypothesis driven to begin with. This led to development of minutia in ecology like null hypotheses. And null hypotheses are great in statistics, you have to have them, but a null hypothesis of, well, imagine you have an ecosystem with no species, how would they form without any data? And you can see why it's minutia. And ultimately it set up flawed thinking, much of it around competition theory and its driving force in ecology, which I'll come to you later. And it, often it limited sample sizes and periods. There was one study done that found that the National Science Foundation, which is the US equivalent of NERC, most ecological studies that were funded were for less than five years in time and for fewer than five acres overall. So while you can ask a hypothesis driven question, what are you really learning holistically? How are the parts put together? You can't answer that question in a reductionist fashion. So hypothesis testing is important. However, one still needs to start from observations of the components of the world and their interactions. And that's where the citizen scientist comes in. They're the ones who are actually out there observing the components of the world and their interactions. So ideally you'd have both inductive and deductive reasoning. And the citizen scientist starts often from the observations. They're collecting the observation data. They're giving us the patterns that we can then analyze. And the scientists may pick it up then to give the hypothesis and the theory going forward. Now, then you go deductively and you take the theory and you might come up with the hypothesis on why is it like that? And that's where you do observation and experimentation to falsify or confirm it. But without the observations, which in our case move on to modeling, 
you can't go to that next step. So inductive reasoning is critical in understanding the way nature is put together. So how is the world put together? Well, what we don't know can hurt us. How much redundancy is there in an ecosystem? How is that particular plant pollinated? Does it have to be pollinated by insects? Does this subspecies migrate? And if so, where? And we're finding amazing things with the satellite tags on cuckoos and other species. What kind of nest or reproductive strategy does that species have? How many species of giraffe are there really? If we think of giraffe as one species, we think about the southern giraffe, which is generally doing fine. And we're ignoring all of the other species, which we now know they are species of northern giraffe, which are endangered or critically endangered. What is the overall species distribution? What happens if the species is driven to extinction? What traits make a species more or less resilient to climate change? And overall, if I pull a thread out of this tapestry, what happens? So the ecologist Paul Ehrlich, the author of The Population Bomb, will often start his talks with a story. And he tells a story like this. I got on the plane and I sat in my seat looking out the window. And I saw a mechanic come and he put a ladder up against the wing and he climbed up on the wing and he popped out one rivet from the wing, put it in his pocket, climbed down the ladder and walked away. I rang the call button, I talked to the stewardess and I said, stewardess, I just saw this mechanic and he popped a rivet out of the wing and walked, walked away, what's going on? And the stewardess says, oh, don't worry about it. He does that every day and the wing hasn't fallen off yet. We don't know which is the critical rivet. We don't know which is the critical thread. What is a lichen? Well, is it a fungus and an alga? When it was proposed, this was widely rejected, including by Beatrix Potter, which many people may not know was a mycologist. Then it was accepted, but now, well, no instances of a two species fungus alga have been observed. That doesn't mean they don't exist, but now that we have DNA and genetic testing, we know it's not that simple. Lichens are often made up of multiple fungi, many times yeast, multiple algae, plus bacteria, plus viruses. They actually use bacteria as part of their physiological process. They're highly complex systems that trade parts at will and as needed. This has led one scientist to claim that we are all lichen, and another scientist to claim we have no idea what a lichen actually is. So we are all part of and reliant on the 10,000 small. Lichen aren't a single alga and a single fungus. Cows can't eat grass. The only way cows can survive is because they have fermenting bacteria that can break down the grass to give them the nutrition they need. And then it means the cows let off greenhouse gases as a byproduct. Some 8% of the human genome comes from viruses. As many as 140 of human genes may be foreign coming from other species. And there are approximately as many bacterial cells in a human body as there are human cells. And without the bacterial cells, you could not survive. The ultimate symbiosis being the mitochondria, the engine of the cell is not human. It evolved separately as bacteria was then absorbed into humans and into other species or all other species essentially. So we are all tapestries. We are all systems of organisms. And then as a system, that system works together. So this brings us to the poem by Augustus de Morgan. Great fleas have little fleas upon their back to bite them. Little fleas have lesser fleas and so ad infinitum. And the great fleas themselves in turn have greater fleas to go on. While these again have greater still and greater still and so on. We're all dependent upon each other. But that's not the way we are able to model the world. When we model for projected impacts from climate change or other environmental issues, we do so one species at a time. 
We know there are some interactions. We try and come up with ways of thinking about them, but ultimately it is still one species at a time. This makes looking at risk fraught with uncertainties. As we think smaller and smaller, we know less and less. Every year, a few new vertebrates are discovered, perhaps some new plants, but we know there are vast numbers of undiscovered and unnamed invertebrates, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. And with no owner's manual, we have no clue how they all interact. Consider this picture. This is from Merlin Sheldrake's excellent book, Entangled Life. If you haven't read anything about fungi, I highly recommend it. This is a picture showing a plant root in blue, and the red is mycorrhizal fungi. And this isn't on the outside of the root, it is embedded inside the root. This then is one of the critical threads of the tapestry, the space between the notes. But we know almost nothing about the range of interactions, the species involved, the dependencies, the redundancies. What happens to this plant if you got rid of that mycorrhizal fungi? Could you replace it with a different species of fungi? Could it survive, but perhaps not thrive without the fungi at all? These are the pieces of information which as scientists, we may lack when we need the information the most. This is from the same book and shows a part of the wood wide web, which I think is an excellent name. In green, those are Douglas fir trees. This is a 30 square meter plot. And each one of those green blobs is Douglas fir tree. And the lines connecting them are mycorrhizal fungi of two different species, so the red and the blue. At the lower right-hand side, one of those trees has an arrow pointing to it. That single tree is linked through mycorrhizal fungi to 47 other trees. What happens if the fungi go away? What is going on inside that network? Well, we think as scientists that it's actually partially communication. As one tree is attack, attacked, say by insects, it gives off signals that the other trees then know it's being attacked and may mount defenses. So there's many things that are going on, but we really don't know what they are. We don't know how they're put together. Ignorance is not bliss. So we have to make decisions. We have to work to save the planet based on incomplete information and information that builds in complexity slowly. Writing the user's manual, understanding the tapestry is not possible without you, the citizen scientists, the new naturalists. One of the most basic parts of ecology is understanding what species occur where. So the black dots in this map are the occurrence data for the prickly forest skink in Australia. And the green is the um, realized distribution of that species based on modeling. And this is what feeds into the Wallace Initiative. So this is a partnership between scientists, myself, Professor Rachel Warren, Dr. Aaron Graham, Dr. Rosanna Jenkins, Professor Jeremy Vanderwall, Nicole Forstenhausler, Professor Ian Atkinson, and you, because you help collect the data. We've been looking at the potential projected impacts of climate change on 135,000 terrestrial species of fungi, plants, invertebrates, and vertebrates at warming levels of one and a half to six degrees C. We look at where species might move to, where refugia may persist, where we should restore habitat, where we need to place protected areas. And this is the link between you and the Wallace Initiative. So here we have the records of willow tit from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. This is where we start. We start with this occurrence data, the data you help to collect. We then clean it. Twitchers are not our friends in this case. What we need to know is as best as possible, where are the species where they are typically found? Now, bearded vultures in the Midlands is very interesting and indeed from a climate perspective, maybe they'd be pushed in that direction. But when I wanna model the range of bearded vulture, I don't want to know that. And I certainly don't want to know about the mockingbird that's currently in um, other parts of, of England or the American bittern that was at Carlton Marshes. And so that's part of the cleaning process. 
is to take care of the vagrancies that are put into it, the coordinate errors, the, the dots that are off the coast, for example. We then use a statistical modeling program called MaxInt um, to develop a statistical relationship between the current climate and the occurrences. Now, there's many different statistical techniques you can use. We use MaxInt because while we know where species are from your data, we don't know where they are not. If you do normal surveys, the breeding bird survey, for example, we can get a much better idea where species aren't because we know that they consistently have been looked for at these sites and they may or may not have been found. So we have to use what are called pseudo absences in our models. We then project the climate into the future to see how the climate envelopes of the species are projected to change. And this is the data which I presented in October of 2019. And this is not the kickoff to giving that talk again. But there are a few of the slides that are the same. So when you look at a single species, this is showing the climatic envelope of Theobroma cacao. Now this is the species that gives us chocolate. And what you see is at this point, this is current. And as the slider drags back across, that's the climatic range with three degrees of warming. So many areas become climatically unsuitable for their chocolate. But that's only part of the issue because as far as we know, chocolate is only pollinated by a single species, the chocolate midge. And we have almost no data on the chocolate midge. We don't know how climate change will impact the chocolate midge. So we use this information to write papers, to come up with hypotheses. And from a policy perspective, this is work led by Professor Warren. And we are looking at, well, how much warming is too much? How much mitigation do we need? If we can come in at one and a half versus two degrees or two degrees versus three degrees, what would the differences be? And often this gets picked up by the press as shown here. Some of it positive, some of it negative. Um, the spin of this paper is mostly positive. We can stay at one and a half degrees, things are generally all right. If we start getting up to three degrees, they're not. But that's not true. You know, it depends on how you view it. If you want to view it that we're well on our way to three degrees, then things are not all right. We use this information to look at where protected areas should be. So in this map, the darker the blue, the area remains a climatic refugia for all of biodiversity, so all the different tax we've looked at, at higher temperatures. But those areas in brown have already been lost to agriculture. And in many cases, they're surrounding blue areas. But if you're trying to figure out how a protected area will persist to climate change, will it still protect the species that are there? Where should we put new protected areas? These are the data we use. This is a plot showing how much natural land is protected and natural and a biodiversity refugia. So climatically suitable for more than 75% of the species studied. And currently it's 12.9%. An additional 1% is agriculture that could be restored. But by the time you reach two degrees, that falls to 6%. By four degrees, 2%. So even if you're trying to meet the current CBD targets of 17%, then the protected area network would have to be drastically expanded to capture biodiversity climatic refugia. The land is still protected, but it's a question of what it's being protected for. We can use the data to figure out where are the best areas to restore. So in this map, um, very complex to look at, but essentially if you look at the sky blue areas and the purple areas, well, those are refugia at four degrees. Those would be the key areas to save. Those are the purple areas or to restore, those are the blue areas. But if you notice this one down here, which is almost all blue with just a little bit of purple, is surrounded by this white blob, well, that means it's a key biodiversity area, but it's already largely been converted to other uses. So planting natural, replanting natural vegetation in these areas, restoring it, these would be the prime places in terms of saving biodiversity. We can look at timber species and you know, we will need to continue to have wood, hopefully in a sustainable fashion for some time. But as we increase the temperature, what you find is that it becomes less and less a refugia. It goes more and more towards brown. 
so that by four degrees, there are not that many places on earth that are able to maintain their current timber species. So that means timber companies are going to be planting non-native species to make up the difference in order to make sure that there's a timber supply with the exception of parts of Norway and Scotland. We can look at extinction risk. So many scientists consider we are in the midst of a mass extinction at about 10% extinction risk owing to habitat loss and exploitation. So basically that we've lost approximately, we think 10% or well on to losing 10% of the species. This plot shows the additional risk projected from climate change alone. The bar, that red line is the 10% line. But if you notice the risk is much greater to the small species than the big species. So in this case, the invertebrates by and large are showing high risk of extinction, 10% of the species at high risk of extinction throughout most of the invertebrates. And indeed at three degrees C and at three degrees C for some like beetles and moths, it could be as high as 20% um, overall extinction, high extinction risk. In the, uh, and with pollinators in the absence of um, dispersal and blockage of dispersal. Plants, um, flowering plants, again, 10% at three degrees C. Fungi, no, they're fine, up four degrees. And with the exception of amphibians, when you look at chordates, when you look at the vertebrates, it's largely the same thing, four degrees before you hit that same risk factor. But amphibians, it's at three degrees. We try to look at interactions, they're very difficult. Here are the baseline maps for common milkweed, um, one of many potential food plants and monarch butterfly. And the overlap is not bad. Um, this, is monarch butter, this is monarch butterfly now, uh, summer and winter, and there's milkweed. But if we look at four degrees, what you see is the climatic envelope of milkweed is substantially smaller. And the overlap with the potential range of monarch butterfly is substantially less. So unless there are other food plants, it means the monarch butterfly will have difficulty going forward that you don't pick up from a single model. Um, people sometimes ask, well, what's, what's your favorite press, press? And I'd have to say being in Wired Magazine. Um, the newspapers pick you up all of the time, but Wired Magazine talking about ecology is not that common when they came out with an article said the year is 2050 and as climate change takes hold, the bees will be the first to fall. And this is actually based on the article that I wrote in Transactions. So people do read Transactions um, as well as science. In this case, the press was picking it up. But what you start looking at when you compare, in this case, flowering plants and pollinators, what you see is if you are green, then you have high species richness for both flowering plants and pollinators. If you're blue, it's pollinators, but not flowering plants. And therefore the pollinators are unlikely to, to persist. If it's yellow, it's flowering plants, but not pollinators, and they're not going to be able to reproduce. But one of the key things about this map are all of the places that are gray. We have no data. So it's difficult to understand what the implications of climate change are in many parts of the world because we have no data on pollinators. Reasonably good data on plants, but very limited data on pollinators. But as the temperature increases, what you see in Europe and what you see in North America is sort of a divergence. So what you have in Europe now is you're seeing a lot of areas that are mostly yellow. Well, that means flowering plants are doing relatively well for species richness, but pollinators are rapidly declining in species richness. But what we don't know is how severe that impact might be because we don't know exactly which pollinator and which flowering plant goes together. The reverse is true in most, much of the Western United States where you end up with pollinators, but a decline in flowering plants. Well, neither is true. You have to have flowering plants require pollinators in many cases 
and the pollinators require the nectar of the flowering plants. So while we can model one at a time, the interaction is saying things are probably worse than we think. Looking at this as refugia, which is again, um, areas remaining climatically suitable for greater than 75% of the species modeled, which you even see at one and a half degrees is that there are significant impacts on pollinators throughout Europe. And we are seeing this in real time. There's, it's very difficult to say the, the declines we've seen are tied specifically to climate change or to neonicotinoids or changes in monitoring practices. We're trying to tease all of that out, but the models would say at least part of it is climate change. And as we increase in temperature, the situation gets worse and worse, where at three degrees in much of Europe, you don't have flowering plants or pollinators. So agriculture becomes much more difficult. Scotland generally fares fairly well. Actually, if you draw a line from Cardiff to Hull and go north, it's much better off than going south. Well, how has science changed? When I started working on climate change and biodiversity, I started modeling birds back in the 1990s, late 80s actually. And many times we concentrated on the big species, the charismatic species, birds, mammals, plants to some extent. And so if you look at bird refugia and you're looking at, well, how, what are the impacts of climate change? You'd say, well, birds do fairly well at three degrees C. I mean, you can ignore parts of Spain and the fact that the Northern Mediterranean becomes much more like the Southern Mediterranean. But generally speaking, as long as we didn't have all that agriculture, we'd have a lot of bird refugia. But if you look at the places where you have birds and plant refugia, the story is much different because plants are projected to see significant impacts in much of Europe and in creeping into parts of the UK. And if you add in insects as well, well, it's a whole nother ballgame entirely. But without the insects, you don't have the food, you don't have the pollinators, which impacts the plants further. Without the plants, you don't have as much habitat, depending on habitat structure, and that impacts the birds. So we have to look at things more as a tapestry. So if you imagine you have a 1000 piece jigsaw puzzle, could you put this puzzle together? Well, most of you, I'm sure you could. What if the box was missing and you didn't know what the final product was supposed to look like? Well, I'm sure you could still put it together. It would just take you much longer. But what if all of the pieces are changing at the same time? And so we've developed what we call the Community Transformation Index, which takes into account species dispersal, how they move with climate over time. And we look across multiple taxa at once. So we look at species loss plus gains through dispersal. And what you see is that even at one and a half degrees, parts of the Amazon, for example, are already showing fairly high amounts of community transformation. And by two degrees, you get both se severe impacts in the Amazon and in through the Biombo region, for example, as parts of Europe. And by three degrees, the impacts from the communities transforming are projected to be much worse than if you looked at the individual species separately. So it tells a very different story. Well, how do you interpret the story? Think of it like this. What if you had 500 pieces from one puzzle, Costa Rica, 250 pieces from Glacier Bay, same artist, same style, so you may not be sure where it comes from, and 250 pieces are missing. Could you build a single puzzle then? And that's the magnitude of changes we're projecting in many communities with higher levels of warming. And this isn't just the Wallace work, it goes back to my original dissertation work. Many scientists have found this, that with dispersal, some species keep up, some species don't. And you end up with this tearing apart of communities as we put it in IPCC. So we need to start thinking about and seeing the world through the eyes of a great naturalist. And this is Piglet. So what I'm gonna talk about now is going back to some philosophical thinking. And these are Piglet's philosophies on how to view the natural world from Benjamin Hoff's book, The Day of Piglet. There's more to the importance of observation than scientific discoveries. There is also the matter of living wisely and well. 
So how do we relearn how to live with nature? We've got to make the observations. We have to see how things change. Is it rewilding? Is it complex rewilding? Is it simple rewilding? Is it simply habitat restoration? We need the observations. We're desperately in need of more citizen scientists. But we also need to know how the pieces are put together, how to live in the world holistically. How do we relearn how to live with nature? And one way we shouldn't be doing it is from a strictly pedantic scientific approach, a classic test for a student. There are 300 cows in a field. The gate has been left open. Two cows pass through it every minute. How many cows are left in the field after an hour and a half? And I'm sure you've all seen questions like this. But the reality from living with nature and being a naturalist is cows do not pass through open gates at the rate of two per minute. In all probability, there would be no cows left in the field 10 minutes after the gate was opened. Or there could be all cows because they didn't discover that the gate was open. We need to view the world in the right framework and not put false frameworks around it. We need to observe, to deduce, to apply. We need to watch what is around us. We have to put aside previous conceptions. We need to look at the world every day as if we're seeing it for the first time to look for simplicity in the complexity, to tease apart the various threads. I was at a meeting once at INCAR in Boulder, Colorado, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And it's on this lovely hillside and foothills of mountains. And it was fairly early in the morning. It was not even coffee break yet. And I'm sitting there and I spent an hour watching an acre of land and watching the birds and the mammals as they moved in the field and in the trees and around the rocks and watching how early in the morning when it was cool, they were all in the sun. And as it rapidly warmed up, they moved more and more in the shade. They were tracking their optimal physiology. They were tracking where the food, where the insects were coming out. It was watching it, it was looking at it as a system, not, oh, there's a rufous-sided towhee. Oh, there's a chipping sparrow. Oh, there's a chipmunk. It was seeing how the parts fit together. So how many of you have done more observing during lockdown? How much greater is the sum of our knowledge now of the suburban nature interface than it was a year ago? On my part, I now know that I have ivy bees in my back garden. I never looked at them before, but last year I couldn't do anything else. And so started looking at the bees and hoverflies following the guidance of, of my wife. So I know much more about the different hoverflies and bees that share the garden with me, but I need to go beyond that. I need to see what are they feeding on? Are they nesting? How are the pieces put together? We need to look for those connections between one thing and another. Notice patterns, relationships. We need to study the natural laws we see operating through these patterns. We need to see and experience things as they are now with change occurring rather than as somebody says they should be or somebody tells us they are. And this is what happened to ecology in the 1970s. And this is where I think a lot of natural science sort of fell off the rails. So as competition theory gained strength, studies were all designed to look for competition. And of course they found it. They didn't find it because competition um, was actually there. They found it because they never looked for alternative explanations. So you could falsify or confirm a hypothesis, but there are other ways in which that same hypothesis could have been falsified or confirmed. It came from starting with a hypothesis, not starting with an observation. We need to think about the space between. Debussy refers to music as the space between the notes. Now I'm trying to learn how to play the banjo and I can sit down with a piece of music and I can play all the notes and I can hear nothing. I can hear notes, but I can't necessarily hear the melody. Why? Not focusing on the space between the notes, not playing the notes in exactly the right way to listen and hear what the music actually is. What is it telling us? So the threads in the tapestry of life are the notes and how they're put together make the pattern, the music of life. How many notes we can take out? How many notes can we put in? How many notes can we play wrongly 
ultimately determines what the music of life will end up sounding like. My concern and that of many of my colleagues is we do not know what the space between the notes is now, how the tapestry is constructed, what it looks like. We, so we have no idea what happens when the notes or the threads are removed. This is the uncertainty that concerns us the most, for we know the extinctions to date have had many trickle-down effects. And this led Benjamin Hoff to formulate what he called the day of piglet, with day being a, a play on TE, the day. To those people who haven't had the inclination or the time to become acquainted with the natural world, never mind, you'll be getting acquainted with it anyway, because over the next few years, the natural world will be coming to you, although not necessarily in the way you'd like it to. It concerns many of my biodiversity colleagues, many of my health colleagues, that while we talk every day about the pandemic, we talk about being locked down, we talk about vaccines, we almost never talk except at the beginning about where did this virus come from? And while we don't know for sure where it comes from, we do know that it came from animals. We do know that it came from bats. We do know that because we were monkeying about with the environment, doing things we probably shouldn't have been doing, the virus jumped into humans, just as Ebola did, just as Nissa, Valley, just as Nissa fever does, just as hantavirus does just as Lyme disease and African tick fever does, from being not in tune with nature and disrupting things. So we're finding out about the natural world that it is coming to us, but not in the ways we'd like it to. Think about the Irish potato famine or famines actually. What would happen if we had a similar type of thing on some of our crops now? Efforts made for adaptation in both crops and cattle are gone in the wrong direction. They're actually trying to make things that are bigger, that have greater yields. And in doing so, they tend to make them less resilient. Cows are much less resilient now to temperature extremes than they used to be. Plants are highly inbred to the point where if you did have a particular outbreak, it would spread much further in the food chain than it otherwise would. Pineapples are heavily treated with chemicals to make them ripen faster. And in doing so, essentially, they are filled with water, but no flavor. And in talking in reading from people in India who are now doing this, the way this story they say is, when the pineapples ripen, they used to be eaten by the jackals. They used to have pollinators around them constantly. Now that it's treated with chemicals, nothing will eat them and nothing will, no, there are no pollinators left. So this disconnect is really what's likely to hurt us. And this brings us back to you. Without citizen scientists observing, reporting, monitoring, it would simply be impossible to know what may happen. We could theorize, hypothesize, and try to falsify, but without the data, your observations, it would be meaningless. The more we learn about the lives and interactions of the 10,000 small, the better the chance of society of being able to save them. So thank you. Thank you for your efforts. And with spring just around the corner, it is time to get out and start the next season of observations. Thank you for choosing me to be your president in 2020, 2021. And thank you for listening. Wow, that was fantastic, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> That was incredible. Um, Thank you. <laughs> sorry to interrupt if you weren't quite quite finished. No, no, I'm I'm through. I will stop the screen sharing. I'll speak for all and just say that that was fantastic. You you've blown my mind without trying to sound too cheesy. Um, and I think um yeah I'll, I'll I'll leave for the for the audience to feedback. But um thank you. If you'd like to stop sharing your screen, um I can't see any questions in the comment section. So um if people would like to pop their hands up or ask questions, now is your time. We've got a few questions. You've almost frightened me to death there, Jeff, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> um, well, I, they have called me, ever since I was a Chico, I was nicknamed Dr. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic talk, thank you, Jeff. Thank you.
I'll go if that's okay. <laughs> I've, I've let the the amount of silence go for, for long enough to not feel like I'm interrupting anyone. So, I mean, I I really I really enjoyed the talk. I actually I've ordered some books um, <laughs> whilst you're doing your talk because I think they're they're fantastic recommendations as well. But I think that um, there's such a good call to action at the end there. You know, with spring coming, there's motivation for us to start recording. And as you say, you know, connect, connecting the dots finding out finding out the different bits I mean what what would you say to to focus kind of I can't talk for the rest of the world because I don't know what's happening rewilding wise in the rest of the world but we've got a number of rewilding projects happening in the UK and actually in East Anglia in particular you've got another one that's been announced in the Brex we've also got Scotland talking about although looking at your map is it not being approached from the right point of view in the first place? It is location specific and definition specific. So when you say rewilding, you know, rewilding automatically has a whole host of different definitions. So the way we think yeah. about rewilding in the UK, which is arguably the way, the way to think about it is, is basically advanced restoration, if you will is different than some of the projects in the Netherlands, which is almost more back towards the Pleistocene and very different to some of the efforts in the US, which are definitely black towards the Pleistocene <laughs> or the efforts within Siberia where they're basically um, bringing in as close to Pleistocene animals as possible to see whether or not you can convert from um, tundra to uh, taiga and to steppe, which you can because it was steppe even in the Pleistocene. None of that, however, changes the climate. It will make local climatic changes because you do get regional climates. If you have trees, you know, you cool things somewhat, you change the transpiration values. So to what extent you can continue with that level of rewilding, um, say Ken, Ken Hills project, or for that matter, NEP, it depends on how much warming you get and what species you're trying to rewild for. Trees live a long time. And so when we model these changes and you look at things like timber, what it's basically saying is they stop reproducing and the likelihood of disturbance from fire insects goes way up, which makes it much more difficult. You could, in theory, design a semi-rewilding project which took more into account climate change. And you might not rewild to this particular species or this particular genotype of, of ash or oak, but you can you come up with something which has identical structure. And that would provide many of the same benefits to wildlife. Um, at least maybe, I don't know about insects, but at least to, to birds and mammals as, as others do. So you can take climate change into account. Now the efforts in Scotland, which I you know strongly recommend because species, even in areas that you show as refugia like Scotland, they'll still be moving and they'll tend to be moving up. So you're still better off if you go from these plantations of artificial species that aren't supposed to be there to more natural habitats and you start restoring it, bringing links back, for example. Whenever you have a more biodiverse system, the thinking is you have a more resilient system. And the more depopulative system is, the greater the impact of climate change will likely be. But there's no getting around the likelihood, even with rewilding in much of East Anglia, that if we start looking at a four degree world, it's not going to make much difference. It may be a pretty park. Uh, we have lots of pretty parks now, but as a functional ecosystem, it'll be very difficult. And so when we're thinking about these projects that have lifespans of 100, 200, 400 years, we need to be taking that into account. Now, if you're planting trees that are two to 300 years old, there's something called um, overshoot, where the temperature may go up to three degrees and then slowly come back down. And so in a managed landscape where you can keep fire out, you may be able to avoid insects. If you have healthy, healthy trees, they may stop reproducing for a while and eventually start reproducing again. But all of those species that can move, the birds, the mammals, um, some of the insects will move. 
And so it's still not going to look the same. So you just need to balance that out and think about how it looks overall. Right, thanks. So the, the people that are doing the rewilding, are they actually, because it's like you said, there's a lot of different definitions of rewilding. There's also a lot of different rewilding projects. And unless they're all working to the same blueprint, if you like, and planning for the future as you just laid it out, then basically, are we saying that they're wasting their time? You know, no conservation is wasting its time. You're always saving the land and you're benefiting species to allow them to perhaps adapt naturally. We don't have a lot of evidence that they will, but it helps. It would be much better if they all started talking to each other. And it's not just rewilding. I'm thinking about all the different living landscape projects. You know, RSPB has one, there's bee lines, there's the wildlife trusts have one. Often the lines on a map don't even cross county boundaries. So the living landscapes in Suffolk don't necessarily match up with those in Norfolk. They don't cut across to Cambridge in the Brex. There is no joined up thinking. And if we don't have joined up thinking for now, they're certainly not taking into account the future. And so we desperately need joined up thinking, thinking about the future. And bee lines in particular is one that always troubles me because most of the bee lines I know, certainly the ones in Norfolk, run east-west. And wildlife tends to follow gradients of either precipitation or temperature, none of which run east-west. Um, it tends to run northish, southish, usually, you know, um, north, usually it's, it's a little bit of a southeast to northwest. But that's the direction we should be looking at. That's, that's where you need to be guided by the science. To some extent, rewilding is looking at things like carbon uptake, the idea that it will help cool, and so the mitigation benefits are there, but you can plant a huge amount of trees and you're still looking at a two to three degree world. So you need to be thinking about these projects in terms of adaptation. Thanks. Um, I guess I should go up to the top of the questions. <laughs> Unless somebody just wants to ask a question. Um, I don't think we should be giving nature an economic value. And in part, it's because we know so little, how do we assign values, but also because nobody believes them. Now, I personally think from my work that Costanza and some of the other figures that actually show you know, trillions of dollars of benefits to ecosystem services is the right value. But as soon as you start talking about the massive values of ecosystem services as a whole, you know, four times GDP globally, and, every, and then all of the people who have a vested interest in destroying nature said, well, the value doesn't exist. We're really better off looking at it from risk because it's the risk that matters. And while we can talk about the risk and, you know, dispirit some of you or, or be depressing, what I can say is rarely in three decades of working on this have I seen things, the models all of a sudden show we were wrong, it's getting better. Um, the more we know, particularly the more we know about the small, then the greater the risk would seem to be. And the th you know, I, th I think this, this push towards assigning values, there are just so many ecosystem services like stewardship. How can you possibly apply a value to it? You can ask people how much they'd be willing to pay to save it. The reality is when that actually comes down, the people don't pay to save it. But if flooding is something people understand, you cut down the trees, you get a flood. That is something people understand. Um, I've got a question. Uh, you go first. <laughs> I was going to follow up to, to what Jeff had just said in a bit of polite debate, if possible. But if you want to go That's first, right. you're welcome to. Who, me? Yeah, sorry. So, okay, it's Mark here. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks, uh, Jeff. Uh, brilliant talk. Really enjoyed that, actually. It was very, um, very 
mind bending. Um, I just had a maybe off the wall question. I guess when we talk about climate change, we hear all these degrees centigrade rise, and I suppose it's mostly air temperatures, isn't it? Um, there must maybe something in there about sea temperatures. I'm not quite sure, but I I just wondered whether you know much about soil temperatures on a global scale, um, whether that's being studied, and whether um, changing soil temperatures are likely to uh, have a big impact on subterranean biodiversity, and if so, how? The answer is yes and no. Um, in some individual areas, soil temperature is being studied. We tend to look at soil temperature as the temperature of the soil tracks in some allometric way with the air temperature and the shading in the trees. And, it, and the idea being that it's fairly consistent. So the soil may be cooler. As the air temperature goes up, that soil will gradually warm up. Where we tend to have the better soil temperature data and information is in the Arctic, where there's far greater concern about melting of permafrost. And so the greatest in interest then is looking both in, as we melt the Arctic soils, are we getting greater release of methane, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than are, are we getting um, uh, just CO2 from the breakdown of the, of the product? That seems to be driven by soil bacteria. So which bacteria species are in the soil depends on whether you end up with methane or whether you end up with um, CO2 as part of the breakdown product. And we know almost nothing about that. So that's one of the big unknowns. A lot of the assumption, this may be a place you may say, well, maybe this is more positive because in the work in some of the LTER sites in Greenland, for example, where they've been running what are called face experiments where they actually put CO2 out and try to change the temperature more rapidly so that they can study it over a very small area they found that rather than all of the plots giving off methane, only some of them did. And I think the thinking originally was, well, it all would give off methane. Well, it's not an all, it's very much nuanced beyond that. The flip side though, is we know very little about termites in the tropics. And in the very limited amount of work that's gone into the possible influence of termites in the biosphere on the climate, the suggestion was it would rapidly increase warming out of the tropics, but it's only one study I know of. And so this is that, that subterranean component is key that we really don't understand very well. And when you get down to things like mycorrhizal fungi, you know, the bottom line is all the fungi we've looked at are based on fruiting bodies. So it's just what people can go out and see. It's not based at all on all the things that we can't see or we can't find. So we don't know what would happen at that level. But we do, the, it's a, we do this for streams as well. We don't have a lot of good data on streams. And so we, have, we tend to use allometric relationships on stream flow and air temperature. And what we've observed to figure out how the stream temperatures will change in the future for fish. That leads quite nicely onto my question, which was, what would you say a starting point for new recorders would be? Is there a particular family or habitat to target? Um, or is it simply a case of basically record whatever interests you because we're, we're, we're in dire need of, of records? I, I put on there thinking of recorders often starting with the more charismatic species like butterflies and birds, and maybe perhaps avoiding spiders, beetles, millipedes, etc. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, you you want to be looking specifically for new arrivals. And that may actually require a bit more targeted searching, but things like butterflies, birds, very well studied. You could argue that in maybe in Norfolk, moths are now, you know, the reason why we have the confidence we do or you know, the, the reason why we can look at moths, particularly for the UK, but in also Western Europe is there's a huge effort of moth trapping. <laughs> and so there's a huge amount of data on moths. 
macros more than micros. And so we really need to know more about the micros, more about the things that aren't being trapped as much. And ideally, if we want to try to monitor things, it needs to be done in a more systematic fashion. So we have huge amounts of data necessarily on moths, but is that coming in with, you know, um, I'm thinking of constant effort misnetting schemes where, you know, you, you net at the same place every week for the same amount of time. Do we have that for places for moths, for example, where we can actually look much better for populations? You know, I moth trap, but I just do it now and then. So it contributes a lot to a survey, but doesn't do much for census. So I think thinking more about censuses, but no, we need, we need much, much better data on spiders, for example. Um, we need far better data on fungi and very difficult. I mean, I have been struggling. I really hope lockdown can end so I can try to meet up with Tony Leach sometime and have him take me out and, and just get me to wrap my head around the common species, much less the uncommon ones, because they all look so different in every life cycle <laughs> and baby ones and big ones. And, and so we need more of that level of thing for recording. I, I think we need to start developing training programs around even the common things to get more people looking for them. And I, I brought this up at, at, for the, wild, the Norfolk Wildlife Trust at one time of sort of like, you know, you go take a class and you get a pin or a little badge and, you know, you, after 10 of these, you're a master naturalist or, you know, so you sort of, you know, you start training people on how to go out and see things and collect the data. And part of that is getting the data into INBIS because that's the starting point where all of the rest of it can go forward then. So I think we need to do much more training in that regard. Follow up to recorders of tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, so somebody wanted to have a slight debate over ecological, about natural capital and economics. I, I was arguing a bit about ecosystem services. Ah, well, so you go ecosystem services. We, we, I've got a system now. I've, I've got a paper in review and, and we're, we're rolling it up globally where we do model the impacts of climate change on 18 different ecosystem services. Now, some of those services you could put values on, on pollination in particular. But the key is, is that when you turn that into natural capital risk, which is taking it the next factor, what you rapidly see is, well, a given species may have five different ecosystem services. And this is where that pulling the thread out is. You know, so which species are doing which ecosystem services and how do they, how do they play through? And we still express that as risk though, because how do you put a value on religious values? How do you put a value on spirituality? How do you put a value on human health and mental health? And health, human health, mental health in particular, is, typically, is not even an ecosystem service, but it should be. But if you go into the literature, it's not there. And yet we now know that that is a critical component. How would we put a value on that? So would you say, because um, my kind of follow up to that is, is how do you, you know, how would we actually communicate risk to a public that, you know, they've been completely desensitized to climate change, they've been hearing for years, you know, biodiversity loss. And I said, Greta did fantastic work, um, you know, a year or so ago, but COVID kind of came in and, and stole the limelight. So how would you, you know, would you recommend that the kind of entry for that is talking specifically about human health and how the environment benefits that? Or how the, how the human health is impacted by it. You know, like I said, we've lost, we, we've lost the steam. I mean, yes, there are uncertainties around COVID and we may never know how it jumped, but the fact that you've got coronaviruses that are very similar and the fact that MERS and other similar viruses have already jumped from bats. What we need for people to understand is it's not the bats that are at fault. It's people messing about with the bats. These viruses have been around and mutating in the bats, in the populations for thousands of years, and they're not jumping into humans. It's 
forcing them together through wet markets, through people going into their caves, through you know, pop, you know, population growth in the wrong areas. You know, we do know that yellow fever, for example, tends to recur around cities in Brazil where there's a high amount of deforestation. So what happens is you take a very distributed monkey population, which might have a low level of yellow fever in it. You push them into a very compact population and what the remnant forests, it allows the virus to build up in the primates, which is then picked up by the mosquitoes and is then spread into the humans. If you had a normal system, you would have a low level of yellow fever and you wouldn't have the human impacts. So I think these are the things that have to go through. These are the things we need to try to teach to reconnect people to nature so they really understand where these things are coming from. Um, ben, you know, I've, I've had conversations with some about, it would be great if we could get Waitrose or one of the, the markets to put little icons on the aisle of this requires a pollinator. So just like they had in winter a few years back where you followed the, 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 the robin throughout the store to find out whether the robin was going to make it, you know, how many of the foods that we eat are pollinators? Now, one store in Europe went much further. They actually managed to, as a fairly small store, they removed from the aisle everything that required a pollinator. And when people showed up to buy food the next day, the, bare, the shelves were almost empty. And they say, well, that's because we've lost the pollinators. And people really got the story then quickly, this is what happens. We are in a problem of what's called shifting baseline. You know, you can go out on and see Blue Planet and they can show all of the plastic bottles and anybody who's been birding in a place like Ghana or, or parts of Uganda see just the sheer amount of plastic trash from water bottles and little plastic retorts blowing around. And you can see all of that and it's visceral and obvious. It's a lot more difficult to show somebody a 10% decline per year. Thank you. I think MS with their plan A could be the, the one to get in there with and say, if you're really passionate about pollinators, where are your labels on your packaging? Um, yeah, no, that's, th thank you for that answer, Jeff. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think Joe's question was next, but I don't know if she's um if she's nipped off. Uh, she unfortunately had to leave. Um, but we can answer it, and Nick can come up. Yes, absolutely. She said. All right. So for so one useful thing for wildlife in order would be to work not only in Norfolk for northish southish corridors, but also to join those up with Suffolk and we need to make sure that they're all joined together. But we have to recognize is that there is a major assumption that corridors will work. Corridors were tried back in the 70s. They largely failed. And they failed because there was no reason. Animals don't have maps. They don't know that if I follow this corridor, I'm going to get to where I need to go. So in the absence of something pushing the animal along, in this case, it'd be climate change, it doesn't know that there's a better habitat on the other side of the field or a mile away. It has to have something actually pushing it along and it then has to have the stops and the resources to get there. Corridors are not a panacea. We know from Australia that the corridors have often been corridors for fire travel and corridors often have invasive species. So we have to look at them very carefully in that regard. So what we need to do is to some extent, the bigger, better, more joined up is the right approach. But we also need to think about these barriers that we're building. We need to think about the new developments that are going in the new cities. We need to think about as these, you know, a, a government who decides, okay, well, we know we need more houses, but this housing estate has to be carbon neutral. It has to plant X number of trees. There has to be trees there. We need to make sure that the planning allows people to bike ride or to walk. It needs to be in a way to get to work. It needs to have fences with holes to allow hedgehogs by. We need to be pushing much harder wildlife friendly gardens, for example. 
we need that we have I've had discussions with people about could Norfolk have sky meadows where you work with Tesco's or with knock cuts and you sell planter boxes with everything you need and native species of flowering plants and you simply put planter boxes up as far as you can to have small amounts of materials because you're not going to get there with corridors you can't possibly have enough corridors what you need are a lot of stepping stones and so what we need are the stepping stones hmm. Pam, I think your question was next. Yeah, sorry, I keep freezing. Um, I was just um, wondering, Jeff, um, what, uh, without trying to be too negative about it, how, what proportion of the world needs to get on board and stop emissions like yesterday? to actually have an effect on halting climate change. And combined to that, would there be any positive benefits of countries going, going carbon negative to mitigate for countries that are politically yeah, well, against? Yeah, that? so going carbon negative is difficult to do. Um, and it all depends on what your end goal is. If your end goal is solely climate change, then there's all sorts of things we might do or be able to conceive of doing that might actually lower the temperature but won't do anything about the carbon dioxide and may cause greater environmental and economic and societal damage to development otherwise. And while we talk a lot about how much has the US done, what is the UK going to do, we all need to do it. And so, you know, you, we have to make sure that we are helping countries shift from their current trajectory, which then often is going to push them into the high carbon bandwidth to make sure that their development from that point is along carbon neutrality or as close as possible. And this isn't, you know, unheard of, and we've seen it with cell phone technology. You know, many of these countries have phones, but they have no copper. You know, they, they'd never had to go the route of putting up copper wires to have telephones. They were able to jump specifically into having wireless technology. But it means stopping exporting, and I'm thinking now the World Bank, you know, coal-fired coal power plants in many of these areas. It's pushing them so they have more neutral technology. Because even if they don't have the emissions now, if everybody else comes down and they continue to have high population growth or this desire of, of having as much as everybody else does, in the same way, so I'm not saying it's bad to have the desire, but having it in the same way, then you end up eventually with them coming up with the emissions. So everybody has to do it. But no, we have to start with the US, China, um, India, deforestation in Brazil and Indonesia. The UK as a whole, it can do a huge amount and it's not gonna make a tremendous difference. But if you, they don't do it, if they're not seen as leaders, then everybody says, well, why should I bother? So we pretty much all have to do it. Carbon negative, the typical way of thinking about carbon negativity is through tree planting. Um, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Habitat restoration is the right way to think about it. So trees are very good at taking up carbon, but so are grasses, so it's peat. Um, so are certain types of wetlands, but not all wetlands. It's all a question of management. So there's higher risk of carbon being released from pastures and grasslands with disturbance and necessarily trees, but you know, then you're getting a win-win. So we should be looking for is carbon negative through restoration to natural structure using as natural a species as possible. So notice I didn't say native species because if you think about climate change, you think about the longevity of trees, 
the native species may not be the best tree because in 20 years or 30 years, they may be impacted by climate change and then they would die and then give the carbon back off. Whereas a similar species would have the same structure, probably the same ecological benefit, certainly the same carbon benefit and could potentially last much longer. Thank you, Jeff. Um, that's, that's what I thought you would say, but I'm glad you confirmed it. Um, I mean, I, I constantly having a battle because um, I work, work at the County Council. I head up the Norfolk Biodiversity Information Service and co constantly have a battle about um, messaging, I guess. So the obvious thing that councillors think will do to deal with climate change is to plant trees and we're planting a million trees in Norfolk as, as part of a project for that. Um, because it's a simple message. Um, you know, it seems to be trees equals reduction in carbon, therefore job done. Do you, do you know, can you think of ways that scientists may have got through to governments with the complex reality of, of the situation. It's vegetation equals a reduction in carbon. Yeah. And that may be trees, but it may not be. Rewetting peat probably does much better in Finland, at least. It, it, the data from um, the broads and from the Finns shows that keeping the peat wet, rewetting peat in this area is probably far more effective than Scotland. But I'd say the data in Scotland probably isn't good enough yet, um, at least at the time I knew about it. Trees and grasses have the additional issue that you have to think about the albedo. Now you're really talking about things that are going to blow the county councillors' minds. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, if you have the wrong color tree in the wrong landscape, you can make things worse. And there have been studies that show that massive tree planting in some areas may actually cause a reverse impact because you're going from say a deciduous woodland where you drop the leaves. And so you've got a winter reflectivity. And so you're keeping cool to a coniferous woodland where it's dark all the time and it's actually absorbing energy. And so you start changing then all sorts of energy parameters and, and moving about. These are all small changes, but taken over large areas, they add up. Now you can deal with albedo simply by also doing things like regulating the color of roadways or regulating the color of roof tiles. And um, then we getting into tricky things like thermochromic roofs, which is really what you would need in the UK that are dark in the winter and light in the summer. So they're dark in the winter, so if it snows, they melt and it helps hold the heat in during the cold time and in the summertime, it actually reflects. And, and these materials exist, they're just more expensive. But the key is to show the council, you know, what, what you have often on the tree side is sustainable forestry people or tree people all saying, hey, aren't trees great? Well, trees take a long period of time to really start reaching their capabilities of bringing in the carbon, whereas grasses start bringing it in in the first year. And even changing some of our agricultural practices will start holding far more carbon. So you're right, knee-jerk reactions are not the, the best approach. Thinking about it as what we need to do is keep the carbon in the ground and try to put the carbon in the ground. And here is a whole bunch of ways you can do it maybe a better approach that they can get to. So you can say, well, look, here's how much a grassland holds, here's how much um, pastures hold, here's how much uh, these different types of woodlots hold, but here's how long you have to keep that carbon before you really start building it up. And so when you have these ideas, like um, what did I read in the EDP, planning on cutting 140 fairly mature trees to build houses, there is simply no way in any reasonable amount of time you're either going to be able to plant the trees or replace the carbon. And the myth, which you get, particularly from the tree people, is that, oh, old trees don't take up as much carbon per year than new trees do. And okay, that's true. 
but those new trees can't store the carbon and they can't put it in the soil. And so as soon as you start, as soon as you cut down a tree, all of the roots from that big tree and their big roots are then over the coming decades releasing the carbon through the soil back into the atmosphere. So no, you don't want to get rid of big old trees. <laughs> Thank you. So I think it's a menu of options, isn't it? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Jeff. I've just had to cut off questions because I realise we're going well into your evening and you've been ever so kind talking to us for this amount of time. Am I right in saying that you're happy to receive questions via email if there's any further ones? Sure. Yeah. Okie dokie. Um, is that jeff.price at uea.ac.uk? Yes. Perfect. Okay. I'll, um, that's been recorded. <laughs> so anyone that would like any further questions, that's there. I'm, I'm ever so sorry um, to cut everyone off as I can see you're all lining up for questions. But yeah, if you, if you pop those or if you pop them to the Natsoft mailbox, we can pass them on as well. I mean, I'm happy to give you a little bit longer if you want. Okay. Yeah, no problem. If there's any burning questions, I just didn't want us to quiz you all evening. <laughs> <laughs> Now's the time, people. <laughs> Jim? Okie dokie. I might take that as a sign. <laughs> Otherwise, right. I'll start coming up with more questions. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll pop you an email with any further ones I have. But just thank you ever so much for a fascinating talk. I'm really glad that we've also got this in the transactions. Um, and we'll be popping this recording up on the website for those to view as well. All right. Thank you very much. And thanks for making me your president. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. I'd like to say thank you as well for all the reading list material you've given this evening as well.